This talk is about interacting with the AI tools, mostly the APIs, using Java. And I really want to use a lot of the latest features in Java. I want to use records. I want to use um, sealed interfaces. I want to use pattern matching for switch, all the good stuff, you know, and see how that helps interact with these various tools. But on the way, I'll talk about the process in general and, and how it works. And my plan is to work with four different AI tools. I'm going to look at ChatGPT, of course, you know, going through OpenAI's API. I'm going to look at Claude from Anthropic as well. And we're also going to take a look at, um, let's see, Gemini, which was just updated supposedly today. I mean, uh, Google Cloud Next is going on, and they're making announcements about that. And then the fourth one is I want to do a one demo with Mistral as well from the company in France. Uh, they have uh, particularly small but very effective models as well, and we'll talk about that too. So just got a wide range of demos, not just chat. I want to do text to audio creation, you know, where you, you send in text and it makes an MP3 for you, and I want to do a little bit of image generation as well. And we'll also talk about some of the big picture items as well, things like retrieval, Augmented, I always want to say automated for some reason, RAG, Retrieval Augmented, gener augmented Generation, and all those related issues, stuff like that. Uh, for your information, my name's Ken Cousin. It's cousin like the relative, just not spelled that way. I think it's an Ellis Island job or something, you know. My one person company is called Cousin IT Incorporated, although my wife pronounces it Cousin It, you know. It was her idea. So at any rate, feel free to contact me at my email address, homepage, blog. I still have a Twitter account, although I try to avoid the place as much as I can. I have a Mastodon account, too. Every Sunday, I put out a free weekly newsletter called Tales from the Jar Side, which is hosted on Substack. Every Monday, I put out a video version of that, as well as some other technical videos on my companion YouTube channel. Those are the books I've written in the past. The QR code, by the way, goes to the YouTube channel. So you don't have to go there if you don't want, <laughs> just letting you know. I will say I admire your endurance for being here at the end of a long day. Uh, thank you very much. And now let me start diving into some of this stuff. Be my guest. Is it not working? Was it working before? OK, <laughs> let's move on. OK, now I do want to mention a couple things. I am going to use my IDE for some of this. I, I have all the code already written. It's spread around like three or four different GitHub repositories. And I'll give you a page that has a link to most of those repositories. There, there's a couple I'm still working on. But I'll give you links to all those for the end. What happened? Oh, it's the uh, HDMI cable came loose. That's all. Yeah, we're good. OK. Can I blame the guy who checked my mic? No? <laughs> I'll try. OK, so oh, uh, let me go back here a second. Uh, what I was going to mention is that I'm going to be using in IntelliJ both the AI Assistant that I subscribe to and, the, and GitHub Copilot, which I also subscribe to. Those are both inside IntelliJ. Since I'm mostly going to work with code that already exists rather than try to write it in front of you, that may not come up much, but I want to let you know. The AI Assistant, I mostly use, um, well, for a variety of things. But one of the things I really love about it is how it generates commit messages for you. I love that part because I hate writing commit messages. And it's very good at that. So that's, that's very helpful. The GitHub Copilot part is what does the various uh, code assist suggestions, you know, suggesting the next line and things like that. Uh, those are trained versions of ChatGPT. I'm sure you're well aware of them if you use IntelliJ at all. OK, but of course, if I have to do anything hard, I may just go to chat GPT-4 you know, GPT directly and copy and paste out of there. They say that Claude 3 Opus is comparable and that Gemini 1.5 is comparable. Use whatever you're comfortable with. I have noticed that virtually every tool in AI costs 10 to $20 a month, right? Now, that brings me what uh, reminds me to bring up one issue that I do want to let you know. The, Situation with the APIs, whether you have a subscription like I was just describing to any of these other tools is irrelevant. All the API subscriptions are pay as you go. They all require you to put in a credit card and a 
minimum balance, you put in five bucks, something like that, 10 if you have to, and then it'll just recharge as you use it. The prices are so low that actually that's the way I use Opus, you know, the um, Claude Opus 3 or whatever, because it's pennies, you know. In fact, I can spend all week preparing for a talk like this and wind up spending a nickel maybe, you know, a dime at most. The costs add up if you put it in production and you have thousands of users, but just as an individual developer, I have a page on this and I'll bring it up, but the idea is the base price, this is the, the way to keep it in your head, for OpenAI, it's $10 per million input tokens. So $1 per 100,000 tokens. I don't know why they went with 10 and a million. I guess a million sounded better. But uh, $1 per 100,000 input tokens, and then output tokens tend to cost like double or triple that, but the output tokens are what you're getting back. You don't, co you don't control that much, you can. The input ones are where you're packing things in in order to give it examples and all the different mechanisms you might use. So it's really input tokens that tend to govern the expense of using these things. But I can tell you, as an individual developer, they're all cheap, they're all fine, until you put them in production, and then they got you, right? Okay, so these are the four services I mentioned I was going to access. I will go with OpenAI. They have their own API. Mistral, of course, I mentioned. They also have a variation called Mixtral, which uses what's known as the mixture of experts mechanism, where they look at different levels with different uh, power, different uh, resolution on the models. Google's flagship model these days is called Gemini. That was their big announcement today at their Google Cloud Next, is that Gemini 1.5 Pro is now available to everybody. I was fortunate I got in on the beta a couple weeks ago, maybe. So I've used it a little bit, and I have one demo I'll show you, you know. But uh, now everybody has access to 1.5 Pro, if you want. Then the one from Anthropic is the one called Claude. So Claude comes from uh, Anthropic, and they released Claude 3, which has models Haiku, Sonnet, and Opus. And I'll take a look at that. That's in order of cheapest to most expensive, and fastest to slowest, and least accurate to most accurate. But I got to tell you, Haiku is very impressive. I mean, even though it's supposed to be the cheap and fast one, the quality is remarkably good. I mean, that, that's a very nice one to put into your systems, if you like. OK, now I'm going to, the thing is, you're going to, we've had AI talks all day long talking about Java. And there'll be more tomorrow. So I'm going to try to pick some things that you might not hear other people talk about, things that might not be quite so obvious. I don't work for any of these vendors. I'm an independent. So this is my own personal experience. So yeah, it's anecdotal, but I don't have an ax to grind. You know, I'm not trying to sell you on any particular thing. So from my point of view, they're just all RESTful web services. I mean, that's all these APIs are. And if there's one thing we do in Java all the time, it's interact with RESTful web services. Now, the, the thing about these RESTful web services is that the only two HTTP verbs that ever come up are get and post. And the get, so it's not all four verbs here. You know, you're not deleting anything from Gemini or whatever. Yeah, you're just asking it a question and posting answers. Now, the get stuff is generally only like one per endpoint where they'll say, hey, you want to know the current list of models? Do a get request. Whereas post is all the interactions where you do chat or generate images or generate audio, whatever you're doing. Everything else is a post. So it's really a single get endpoint and then a bunch of posts that you might do. And that's pretty much it. So what do you need in order to pull this off in Java? Well, you need a way to get there. You need some kind of networking client. And you need a JSON parser, something to generate JSON data and parse it. And I know everybody calls it JSON. But I mean, I like picturing a guy with a machete and a hockey mask while I'm working on this stuff, you know? Sure. So I mean, otherwise, where's the humor? OK, now for networking, I have several examples. In fact, I have one GitHub repository. Again, I'll give you the links to those later, where I did not use the Spring framework. Now, I imagine most people are quite familiar with Spring. It's really hard to spend much time in the Java world without dealing with Spring. But I do have a GitHub repository that does not have anything Spring related in it. And for that one, the networking is either coming from the HTTP client that was added in Java 11 
or in a couple cases, I had to go to the Apache HTTP client because there are just some things that the Java one doesn't do well, whereas the, the Apache one has been around for decades and is very effective. When I use Spring, then we've got like four different clients which I listed on this page, even though the last one's kind of related to the other three. They've had a REST template as long as I've used Spring and I lived on that thing. But the REST template is, it's not exactly deprecated, but its days are numbered, you know. Uh, the web client that was introduced back in Spring 5, I believe, is the asynchronous version, which does uh, Flux and Mono and all those types. I have that, but I don't use it that much. The REST client that came out in Spring 6.1, so last October, I mean, very recent, that one is the web client API, but this time it's synchronous. I expect that eventually will replace the REST template. So my examples use those two, the web client and the REST client, but what I really like are the HTTP interfaces, which I refer to as the HTTP exchange interfaces because that's the annotation you use. And I use those a lot. What those are especially good at is allowing you to have uh, one interface with several methods that are all implemented for you by Spring. All you have to do is set up a couple of beans and define a, a method in the interface and everything happens from there. Again, I know this is all very abstract, but I'll show you the code. And I'll, see, I'll show you what I mean by that exactly. So I use that all the time. For the JSON parser, when I'm doing J JSON on my own parsing, I mean, when I'm not using Spring, I tend to default to the JSON one, mostly because the JSON builder has a factory method to convert camel case to lowercase with underscores and back again. So I don't have to do it per class or anything. I could set it on the builder, actually, and that works really nicely. Also, the parsing and the, and the generation is, are one-liners. It's from JSON or to JSON. It's really easy. Spring, however, comes with Jackson. And the best thing about Jackson for me when I was playing with this stuff is Jackson has understood records from the time records were released in Java, Java 16, which is wonderful. Because records and JSON data go together like this. I mean, it's a perfect pairing and it's really easy to do. Jackson understood records from day one. JSON was last of the ones I played with, not until like last summer did it finally understand records. I mean, you got classes with no default constructor and no setter methods, and JSON didn't know what to do with that. Now they do, okay. Now, uh, one thing that I'm gonna point out, uh, Mistral, as it turns out, has the exact API as OpenAI's API. In fact, it was from Mistral, I was able to download the, the spec, you know, in the Open API as opposed to OpenAI. <laughs> open API spec, what we used to call um, Swagger, you know? There's actually a file you can download and it'll tell you the, all of the information and everything in a, in a processable form. So I'm gonna do one little Mistral demo right here. Let me just give you an idea. So let's see, that's here. Um, so this is a Spring Boot application. This is one of my examples. But this one did not use the HTTP exchange interfaces. Instead, I'm going to just access this with the REST client directly. Uh, I checked before, but let me check again. Font size big enough? You're okay with that? Okay. So, all right. I put in constants for the models that I use. I, I find that a very convenient practice. I hate it when I spell the name wrong. Or once I put in an underscore instead of a dash and got really weird errors when I was trying to access the model. So this is very simple. For my REST client, I just called the create factory method and gave it the base URL. That's how simple it is to get started with the REST client. So one thing I always do is I start off by listing the available models inside there. And look how simple it is to do this. With the, with the REST client, all the HTTP verbs are methods. So I just call a get, that's the path that goes past the base URL. The base URL is up here. Now, each of these models will require an authorization header. All of them are like that. And the convention that seems to have emerged in the field is when you get your API key, because you go in and you register and you put in your credit card, put the API key as an environment variable on your system, and then Java has a method called uh, getEnv on the system class, the static method getEnv, which retrieves it from your environment. 
So very easy to do, and that is the way to keep you from yourself from accidentally putting your key in the GitHub repository. You know, there's a little frowned on. So at any rate, that's how you get that in there. And all these authorization headers on all the APIs look a lot like that. Now, some of them have their own special headers. Claude adds a couple of extra headers you have to put in there. Mistral doesn't, and Mistral just says, put in the accept header to say that you want JSON data back. A lot of them require you to put in a content type header to say what you're sending. The content type header is not usually a problem. If the accept header, though, uh, if you forget to put it in or you put in the wrong thing, it doesn't work at all. So I, I generally find it a good practice here. So we put in the headers, you call retrieve, and you turn the body into this. And this is how I, um, OK, these are the records that I put together for the overall OpenAI service. And again, Mistral uses the same records because it's the same uh, curl requests, basically, same structure. So let me skip the chat request and response, and this is where we went to. And the beauty of records is you can nest them anywhere you want. You can build them right inside the method you happen to be writing and then promote them later. But if you're building your records, you could just stare at the JSON data and work top down and just build the records together. And all you have to do is define the arguments and then write a test, make sure it's generating what you want. And then if you decide to make them public, that's fine. Now, the downside to records, if there is one, is that if you make them public, they have to go in their own file, right? Just like classes all have to go in their own file. So something that I have kind of adopted as a practice, whether you agree with this or not, that's up to you. I now make a single class that has all my records in it and make all the records live inside that class, and then they are all accessed with static imports. So it would just be OpenAI records dot model list, for example, and then I add that as a static import and it all looks clean, but this way I can see them all together. <laughs> so I just want to be able to see them, and you could always change that later. So I have model list as a list of model objects, and here's the model object, just has an ID, a created, and an owned by, and this guy's the problem, the owned by, because that's camel case, and of course inside JSON data it's lowercase with underscores. Well. In Spring, there's a property you could set in the application.properties file to do the conversion automatically. It doesn't work with records. It works with regular classes, but it doesn't seem to work with records. So I kind of reduced to either JSON naming, saying I'm using the snake case strategy. Isn't that great? Snake case with the underscores, as opposed to kebab case, which is the dashes in between, or if everything's uppercase with the, with the underscores, that's screaming snake case, right? I thought it was funny. At any rate, uh, unfortunately, I have to do that on a record by record basis. So I assume that's going to get fixed, and I won't have to do that very long. But there it is, and with GSI, I didn't have to do that. I did override the two string method just because this is a Unix timestamp in seconds since January 1st, 1970, you know, the current epic. So I, I couldn't resist converting it into a local date time, okay? But look how simple that is. I've got my model list and I got my model, and all I have to do is do this list of models, and if I bring up my test case, then let me go down here to the list models, and I will run that. And uh, you navigate down, I grab the models, and then there's a data property inside it, turn into a stream, I'll print them out, I'll map them to their IDs, turn them into a list, and just verify that the ones I made constants for are, are all in the list there. And it always takes a moment the first time I do it. I don't know why there's a delay, but it'll, it'll figure it out and then uh, zip through it. So it's our powerful, high power Wi-Fi in here, right? Um, while that's going on, let me jump down to the part where I'm gonna actually do a chat, you know? Uh, yeah, there they are. Just a moment. Let's bring that back up. And you can see here, uh, I've got some word wrap going on, so let me back this up. See, all the IDs come out, and those are the names of the models, and there's the created with my timestamp, and the owned by, of course, is all Mistral AI, so I don't even need that. When you're mapping to get requests, you don't have to map all the fields, but if you're mapping to post requests, you're not sure what's nullable and what isn't. So you probably have to put those in. But with get requests, I could have left the own by out. But I wanted to see it just to know that I did the mapping right, that the, the camel case was being converted to snake case. Now, 
Okay, let's go on. Let me show you the OpenAI one. And actually, let's not do OpenAI first. I'm going to go to Olama, of all things. Now, if you're not familiar with Olama, Olama is at, it used to be at olama.ai. And didn't the island of Anguilla, I guess you pronounce it, boy, didn't they run into a windfall. If you're not familiar, they're a little island in the Caribbean that has the domain registration of AI. And seriously, almost 10% of their government budget last year came from companies registering under a .ai domain name. Seriously, I mean, it, and it's out of nowhere for them. It's like, oh boy, you know, and, and it's just a huge windfall out of nowhere. Seriously, they made like $25 million last year on domain name registration. So, But now Olama has changed. Now they are uh, olama.com, so like everybody else. If you're not familiar with Olama, this is how you can install AI models on your local hardware. One of the concerns people have when they want to put in their own data is, am I sending my data to whatever the AI company is. And they all say, no, we're not going to use it for training data. Then the question becomes, do you believe them or not, right? And you know, is there legal issues? And, and what are the licensing arrangements? And all kinds of stuff. With a llama, nothing leaves, leaves your local machine. Everything is local. And you can install a variety of models here. This is a one-click installer. With that download, they have an installer for Mac and for Linux they have a script for Linux, and they have a Windows installer tool that's still considered experimental, but everybody I've talked to didn't have any trouble with it. Then you download a model, and these tend to be open source models. Code Gemma was the Google one that got updated today, part of their conference. Of course, the name Olama is Open Llama. It came from the Facebook slash Meta one called Llama 2 and so on and so on. And some of these, by the way, let's see if I see one pretty quickly, have the word uncensored in them. Doesn't that sound good? Made a whole video about that. Here's the thing, uncensored means they don't have the same guardrails as several others. So they're not image generators, you don't have to worry about that. But there are lots of questions these days that companies get really paranoid about. And when you ask a question related to those things, they won't answer it. They'll go, no, sorry, I can't give you an answer on that. These uncensored models were designed to allow those questions through. So I have like examples where I ask, you know, what's the current price of a kilogram of cocaine? Or, you know, um, how do I break into a car? Or, you know, <laughs> what's that? How to build a bomb, yeah, I asked it that. You know, I said, what's an effective, reliable mechanism for, you know, oh yeah, and they'll give you an answer. Now, you have about as much faith in those answers as in any other answers you get out of these tools, you know what I mean? But hey, the uncensored models are fun to play with, and not only is none of your data leaving the site, the NSA doesn't hear you asking those questions either, you know, so that's not going out either. So those are fun to play with, and I, again, I have a whole video about that. Now, with Olama, the deal is they have a very simple web server that comes with what your installer has. And the web server runs on port 11434, and that means they also have a REST API on top of it. And it's a very, very simple one. And they have one type of request for chat and a different type of request for what they call vision models. With a vision model, you're uploading an image and saying, what's in this image? OK, with that in mind, let me go to Olama here. Uh, Olama Records, there we go. So I want to be able to do both a chat request and a vision request in the same system. Now, in, in all the other cases and in other languages, you would make separate endpoints, separate requests, separate responses all around. Here, all I want is my, um, I meant, let me open it up here. I think I forgot to open one. Olama interface. All I want is this chat interface. See, this is one of Spring's HTTP interfaces. There's, the, after the base URL, they all have slash API. This is the one that calls chat. And there's also one that calls generate. They have two different endpoints. 
one that's really simple, one that has a whole series of messages. But I want my request to be a generate request and return a generate response, or a chat request and return a chat response, just names I made up, okay? Because one's called generate, one's called chat. And the beauty of this is once I have this set up, then I can add extra methods if I need to, and, and again, it's all implemented by Spring for me. So going back to the Olama records, how am I going to make a generate request that satisfies both requirements? That's where sealed interfaces in Java become very convenient. So Olama generate request is in fact a sealed interface. Sealed interfaces have a permits clause which says only the classes listed after permits are allowed to implement this interface. I mean, I, could, I didn't have to seal it, but the reason you seal it is because later I could put it in a switch statement and switch statements, switch expressions now have to be exhaustive. I know exactly what the possibilities are, so I don't need a default clause or anything like that. Switch statements, switch expressions, and sealed interfaces go together really well. So there are three properties that are in common in both the chat model and the vision model, model, prompt, and stream. And then here's a text request as model, prompt, and stream, and that's all it has, whereas the image request has model prompt a list of images as base64 encoded strings, and then stream as well. And the stream here doesn't mean Java stream. That means, you know how when you ask ChatGPT a question, you get back one word at a time? That's the streaming model. And unfortunately with Olama, that's the default, is to turn that on. And the problem is then you're getting response, 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 one word at a time. Yeah, I don't want that. I want to turn that off. Just give me the answer when you're done, you know? I don't, it, it, that stops becoming entertaining very quickly, I think, you know? So here is my generate image request. And here is another feature of records that a lot of Java developers don't think about or aren't aware of. That looks like a constructor. In fact, it's called a constructor, but it's called a compact constructor. Do you notice the lack of parentheses on that? No parens at all. What's the purpose of that? It allows you to transform your input data or validate your input data for the record. So when you say, oh, new Olama generate input image request, you put in all these values and it runs it through here. Now, this is a, again, somewhat questionable usage of it, but what I'm doing in this case is I'm saying, okay, take that images collection, turn it into a stream, and say, hey, is the image already a base64 encoded string? Which down here I have a little regex that GPT-4 helped me come up with to see, you know, does it match that structure? And if, if it is, use it, and if not, then I have a little file utils class I made that does the base64 encoding, which Java has built right in. Java.util.base64 has a get encoder method that will let you do the encoding. So I'm transforming a list of, say, URLs that are coming in into base64 encoded strings. And it's really easy to do this. A different example I have with actual like images for Dolly 3, because I'm doing a spring app, I can use JPA annotations, like at min or at max or at size, and do validation on the input request. Again, this is something that's been in records for years, and well, since they came out, and I missed it when it first came out. It took me a while to realize how to do it. And that's all it looks like. And the response is the same in either case. You just get your output back, and you could run this and load it on, on any of the ones you want. Now, my Olama interface here, again, the recommendation I'm going to give, and I do this on all the different ones, is you start off with the interface being really simple. Just whatever request looks like comes in, whatever response comes, looks like comes out. But that's not convenient for a user. That's convenient for us. So what I do is I always make a service class as well. So there's my Olama service. And you auto-wire the interface into the service, and this is where the constants go and the convenience methods go. Like, oh, okay, you're getting back this Olama response. Let's drill down to where the answer is and just return a string, you know? Or let's have them, for example, this chat here says, there's a model, there's a question. I'll build up the request by hand, go ahead and delegate to the interface, and then drill down and get the answer back when I'm done. 
And this tends to be really easy. Um, so that's very useful. Now, one thing I want to mention here about the conversation, when you work with ChatGPT directly, or any of the ones that have a web interface, all the requests feel like they're connected, like it remembers what you just asked it, it remembers the responses. This is known as a context window, okay, the amount of stuff it, it re recalls. When you use the API, every single request is independent of all the other, they're all stateless. Oh, I have a stateless services joke. I go one of those. Uh, I say to you, you know, I think all services should be stateless. And then you say, really? Why do you think that? And I go, why do I think what? <laughs> yeah. Feel free to reuse that. I don't know where I got it. You know. Oh, wait. I had something ready for this. Just a moment. Uh... Oh, come on. Come up. <coughs> there. Okay, that's what I needed. Yeah. Okay, so that's, um, each request would be independent of each other. So I have a little sample, not in this one, where I wind up asking two questions, like, you know, I give it my name and say, what's my name? And the second one, it goes, who are you? I have no idea. I don't have any context on that, because they're independent. What you do in all of these models is there are messages. They all define some message record or class. And in the message, there's a role, R-O-L-E, and then the actual message itself. And the role is either user message, which is what you're submitting, or assistant message, which is what's coming back. There's a couple other types too, but stick with that for the moment. If you wanted to remember what you're doing, then you make a list of messages, and they alternate, role, uh, user assistant, user assistant, user, and it remembers all the earlier ones, because you're giving it to it, you're putting it in the list. And that's your memory, which means that the longer the conversation goes, the more you're going to wind up filling that context window, the more expensive each request will get. Again, it's, it's fractions of a cent. We're not talking a lot, but it's something to be aware of. Okay, that's how they do conversations. And it's just like doing it in a web page, except you have to do it manually. In this particular one, I'm putting in a string dot dot dot, a var arg list of strings, so here's my model, here's my Varag list of strings, and I say, okay, let's put in the first message. Actually, every even message is a user message, and every odd message is an assistant message, or the other way around. But I put them in there so that they're consecutive like that, so I can ask it questions. So if I go to my test here, for example, uh, they always ask it, why is the sky blue? I'm not going to ask it that, you know. But here was the example of a conversation. There's the question, that's the user message, that's the assistant message that came back, there's your next user message to see, well, then how's that different from me, scatter me scattering, and that way it doesn't go, how is what different, you know? It understands it, and that works out pretty well. So again, I built that myself, but you can do it in whatever way seems logical to you, you know, however you could structure it. Okay, let me move on. But see the combination of records and sealed interfaces and how that works? Let me show you what that looks like in Claude, and then I do have to move on. Now, Claude comes from um, Anthropic. Now, Anthropic requires an extra layer in order to wind up getting a key. In fact, if you go to, to console.anthropic.com, they're going to say, oh, fill out this form, you know, and what are you going to do with it and all that. And I put in some very high-level stuff. Oh, I'm going to make some presentations. That's all I said. You know, I'm going to be evaluating for that. And it took, I don't know, two, three days. And then I got back, oh, yeah, okay, go ahead. Go ahead and get your key. And, you know, then I could start prompting using Claude or what I'm more likely to do here is explore the documentation. And then they'll show you all the stuff, you know, and how do you get into the models and how do you work with it and how do you do your prompt engineering. The one thing, by the way, is really different about Claude than all the rest. They love using XML tags inside your message. Seriously. I mean, now those of us who've been in the field long enough, remember there was a brief moment about 20 years ago when XML was popular. I mean, it is hard for anybody younger than, what, 40 to remember that or imagine that? But it's true. There was a time. And then it was like, no, I'm getting cut on all those angle brackets. I don't want to do XML. Well, what Claude actually says is in your big input message where you're asking it to do stuff, 
like separate out examples and make an example tag. Example tag, close example, or put in request and close request. It says it doesn't matter what the tag is. There's no validation of the tags. There's no schema. It's just set them off by XML tags, and that way we'll know how to interpret it. I'm like, really? XML tags? And they're serious about this. If you look at their prompt guide, they'll walk you through it, too. So at any rate, it's, it's what I find highly amusing about Claude and all this. Now, with Claude, uh, for example, if I go to the text generation, and I come down here, where is the API documentation? Ah, here we go. Um, yeah, I don't see the example right off the bat, so I'm, I'm just going to go to my data here. So here is my Claude set of records, and this one got a lot more involved, because in order to do both the chat and the vision model, it kind of, those were really different. With the Alama one, it was so simple, I was able to do everything with one interface. Here, I had to say, okay, here's my model, and notice with this one, with the camel case, I used the at JSON property annotation, which you do one by one. That worked out just fine. Temperature is the degree of randomness you're willing to accept in the output, uh, in the creativity, if you will. So if you're doing something very creative, give it a higher number, closer to one, or some of them go up to two. If you are doing something where you want the same answer every time, give it something very close to zero. That idea, you put in a temperature, and there's your list of messages. So I actually have three different types of messages here. One, where the content, there's a role, and then there'll be a content, is just a string. Why is the sky blue? One, where you actually, the content is a list of text-related messages, where each one has a role and a content. And then the third one is the image messages in the list. So I've got three totally different things here. So I made this interface called message, and this is the simple text message where the content's a string. Here's a text message where it's a text content, and that here is a type in a text. And this one is a list of content, which has uh, both text and image content, looks like this. And you see it got elaborate pretty quickly, but fortunately this one was easier than the OpenAI one. But if I look at the service now, uh, let me bring up the test here. I'll show you what these examples look like. So here I'm auto-wiring in the service, and here, for example, I'm going to use the haiku model to write a haiku, right? You know, which, of course, I also use sonnet to write a sonnet and opus to write an opus, of course. So here is uh, the nested test in JUnit 5, and just to run those three, while that's going on, which shouldn't take too long, I'll show you that, notice, uh, whoops, sorry, each of those is a question and then which model. Oh, that was, that's better. And then this one is the conversation test. Now, I'm the person who ran the mutant lab that turned Wade Wilson into Deadpool in the movie. What's my supervillain name? And get a response and say, what did Deadpool call me in the movie? And of course, it's going to go, I, I don't know who you are or what you're talking about. You know, so then I did it again, but I had to supply the answer. The reason I had to supply the answer is Claude tells me when I ask it that first question, yeah, I'm violating IP rights. I can't answer a question about Marvel. I'm like, what? But it refuses to answer a question about Marvel. So I had to put it in myself so I could get that. So at any rate, here's the haiku. Let's see if we get lucky. Coding with a AIs, AIs, A's, that's six? I think we're off already. Okay, Java's power amplify, that's seven. Innovations thrive, that's five. So it depends on whether you consider AI to be one word or two, one syllable or two, right? And these things are terrible at counting syllables, just so you know, okay? And then how did the sonnet do? Uh, let's move that up on the screen. With Java's strength and AI's guiding light, I'm nauseous already, but at any rate, <laughs> marketing, right? It looks like it's A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, D, E, D, E, and then F. Yeah, it looks right. I mean, it's got the right number of stanzas and everything. Maybe it's good. And then opus, you know, in the realm of code where logic reigns supreme. Yeah, 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 yeah. On and on. And actually, that's one of the shorter ones I've gotten out of it, you know? Okay, so that worked, and then, oh, I want to do the, the supervillain one. So just to show you, if I run them as independent questions, 
then you'll see, again, you run into these guardrails, and the guardrails are going higher and higher all the time because the companies don't want to get in trouble. They don't want to be criticized. So it gets so annoying. By the way, I turned on logging in my Spring app. That's why you're seeing all that extra stuff. I really need it. So here it goes. Uh, I apologize, I cannot provide a specific supervillain name. That would involve reproducing copyrighted material. No, it wouldn't, but I can't argue with it. I can offer general guidelines, thanks. And then the second question, it went, um, I do not have enough information to determine the specific name because it didn't know who I was talking about. Whereas if I do this where I built the messages myself, where the output of the user message was this assistant message and then asked the user message, this should come up just fine because uh, uh, you're, yeah, there you go. Your name is Francis, right. I mean, you know, if you saw the Deadpool movie, it's a running gag, you know. So I needed a conversation. Okay, and then here, uh, not that one, not that one. Yeah, here is an image one. Okay, so this is a vision message, and you see how it got a little bit more complicated. So first of all, I have an image that was generated by Dali. So here's my happy leaping robot in the spring. Get it? You know, uh -huh, wait a minute, wait a minute, where, where did I put that thing? There, okay. So that's my robot in the spring, and I'm going to say to it now, okay, uh, I'll turn into base 64 encoded string. I'm going to go to haiku. I'm going to say list of mixed content, list of image content. There's my image source. There's my text content, which says what's in this image, okay? Now, again, that is kind of awkward from our point of view, which is why I would add an extra method in the service to simplify that. Just give me the file name and the text, and you see there's the base64 image, or that's the, uh, the base64 string, encoded string here, and it comes back with, oh yeah, I gotta really scroll down. That, that's why I gotta turn off the debugging. Uh, it says, this image depicts a futuristic robot or android figure standing amidst a lush green forest environment, blah, 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 you know? Uh, one use case, potential use case for this they always talk about is uh, you take a picture of your refrigerator and you ask it, what, can I, what recipe can I make with these contents, you know? Something like that. Don't get your hopes too high on the vision models. They're okay. I mean, it did see there was a robot in the forest, but there was very little in that image, was there? I mean, there's not a lot to confuse it. So you could try it. I mean, that's the nice part about this. You can experiment, but you know, I try to do a, I work with a, a food pantry to try to help them say, okay, take a picture of the food pantry. We'll try to make an inventory from it. No, no, we're not there yet, okay? Not able to do that. But at any rate, that's an idea. Okay, so that gives you an idea how you work with the sealed interfaces and the records. I don't have the pattern matching for switch in that example, but uh, you get the idea, hopefully. Okay, uh, I told you about a llama. Let me move on. Yeah, records that can be nested anywhere. I want to talk to you about the image models now. Okay, so let me go to Dolly now, and I think I have that. That's Gemini. Yeah, here we go. So here's Dolly as a test. Let me go to my Dolly service here. And once again, this is delegate, oh, sorry. This one is not a Spring app. This is just regular old Java HTTP client idea here. So I did make my constants for Dolly 2 and Dolly 3 and for my base URL. There's no reason to go to Dolly 2 anymore. It is a little cheaper, but I think the difference is uh, Dolly 2 is four cents an image maybe, and Dolly 3, no, 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 Dolly 3 is four cents an image, eight cents an image for high def. But I haven't noticed much difference between the low def and the high def, they look fine to me, so I only stick with that. And the Dolly 2 ones are like a tenth of that, you know, but they're also, like if I generate images with Dolly 2, I gotta go lie down a while, you know, I mean, they're, they're creepy, so, you know. <laughs> Uh, but here's how I do it. I make my JSON builder so I could set the field naming policy to lowercase with underscores. There, that's going to take care of all those camel case to lowercase conversions for me. And then to get images, I make an image request, which will have the, num the model, the prompt, the number of images. I hard code it in standard because rather than the high def. With Dolly 3, you're restricted to one image at a time 
and the size is either 1024 by 1024 or there's a couple of bigger non-rectangular sizes. And here's the other thing I like to do. Now, let me go to the image request and show you what I'm doing here. Now, this all looks like just fine, you know? I mean, nothing special. I just have the different rules here all listed above. But if I go back to my Spring app in this one and bring up the same thing, image request, check this out. You see, this is the same thing, but in a Spring app where I added the bean validation starter, right? The one that came from Hibernate but is now a full spec. So I just distributed in the annotations from the bean validation. Like there's my not blank and my regular expression pattern for the model and the max size for the prompt. And uh, for the response format, oh, and the other one, I thought I made a, an enum out of it, but here I didn't. Now, what about the fact that if I'm using Dolly 3, this has to be one? That's the sort of thing you can enforce in the compact constructor, see? Then I could write my own code to go, oh, if you're doing Dolly 3 and n is not 1, that's an illegal argument exception. See what I mean? And it was easy to do with these records with the compact constructors and the JPA annotations. Now, going back to where I was, OK, so uh, the other thing is this response format. Now, if you go with the defaults, you get back a JSON object that has a URL in it for the generated image. So you would need a second request to download the image. And you have like a couple of minutes or something to go do that. So usually you build it as one request right after the other. But alternatively, you could set the response type to base64 JSON, and they'll give you the, the bytes directly. They'll give you the string as the message. And then all I have to do is decode it. You know, So I like to do that. So I send the image response. And you can see in my response here, it's just a created and a long of image data with all that stuff in it, you know. Uh, and now I can navigate down and I map it to the base64 image, uh, base64 JSON part. And then this is, again, I have a, a, a helper method I wrote that goes base64.getdecoder.decode, and then I save it into a file. So that's the get images. And let me go to the test case here. And let's see, there's the one that I did, the photorealistic image of a happy robot jumping in springs, thrilled he accomplished a hard time. No, 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 where's my other one? Oh, it must be in the spring one. So, uh, no, that was right. So, just a moment. Dolly 3, service test. And, yep, cats playing gin rummy. That's what I want, right? I mean, what's a presentation without cat images? So let me try that one with Dolly 3. Oops, did I, oh, I hit my keyboard. There we go, let me try again. I accidentally put a slash in the middle of a word. Yeah, that's not gonna work out well. Uh, and I'll have it generate that, and then I'll show you what the, what the picture looks like. And it shouldn't take too long. See, there's the image request. That's in my application.properties file. I just have the um, logging.level.web set to debug just so I could see the outgoing messages and the incoming messages. It's very helpful for debugging purposes. Okay, so the image wound up in a file in source main resources images, and you see I've got a timestamp in there. So if I close this and look under that one, which that should be the only one today, right? <laughs> I mean, okay. You know, I mean, not too bad, I guess. I don't know if that's worth saving in the GitHub repository. <laughs> and don't look too closely at the cards, you know? I mean, those are always kind of dicey there. Um, but cats are probably cheating anyway, so it's probably not a big surprise. You, you know cats. Okay, so that's the idea. Now, to give you one thing that's different from the others, because how are we doing? We got 10 minutes to go? I have two uh, last demos I can show you to give you an idea of some things that are different. First of all, Stable Diffusion, the open source one from Stability AI, for however much longer they last. I mean, not a well-run company as I hear, from what I hear. Uh, they had a very similar model to what we've seen. I mean, you find the JSON data, you map it to records, you set up your HTTP interface, you inject it into a service and pre and post process the data. They changed their entire model between Stable Diffusion version one and version two. Instead, 
Now they want form data, form data instead. M multi, you know, multi, uh, uh, multi type there with, uh, with form data, and it all changed. And I could not find an easy way to do that with, um, with the Java HTTP client. So instead, I use the Apache HTTP client, and I think I have that, wait a minute, it's along the top here, not that one, this one. Okay, so Stability AI. So what you see this time is I'm using classes from uh, Apache's HTTP client, or HTTP components, HTTP 5 client uh, that I'm using, HTTP client version 5. So there's my closable HTTP client, there's the URL, again my authorization header, my accept header, they say use image slash star, and then the prompt, of course that's the text I'm putting in, see it's a multi-part entity builder. This is the funny one though, if you look at the documentation it says, oh no, it says you have to put in a content type header but don't do it by hand because it needs one of those uh, boundary elements. And I don't know about you, but I've been doing this stuff for a long time. I never used a boundary element before. I did figure out a way to hard code it, to hand code it, and I went, this is crazy. This multi-part entity builder will do it for you, fortunately. So my output format's gonna be a ping file, PNG file. Am I the only person who calls that ping? <laughs> I hope, I, I don't know. Uh, and then you see here that you execute the request and you send in that, that was an HTTP post up here where I put in the entity, and I'll get back uh, the response, and I'll print it, and I'll just say save it in a file, and I've got my test case here. Again, I think my cat's playing gin rummy. Let's see what it does with stable diffusion, okay? So all these have their own models, but they're all similar, which is why we're able to do things like frameworks like Spring AI or Langchain for J, they're trying to build universal a APIs for all of these, and good luck with that, man. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you can do that, and there's nothing wrong with doing that, but the reason I do this stuff at a lower level is if they add a new feature, I could just use it right away. I don't have to wait for the framework to come up with it. A lot of these things are very routine, plus it was kind of fun anyway. Uh, so, okay, this one I built in the name into that, so... Yeah, there it is. See what we got here. Ooh, nice. I like that one better. Yeah, especially the dealer with the with the jacket and tie and all that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Okay. Do I? Pardon me. Oh, so I don't know what they're betting, right? I mean, that <laughs> that probably affects it. Okay, so that's one thing. Now, there are going to be many talks, and there probably already have been here about RAG retrieval, augmented generation, and all that. I don't, I'm gonna say one thing about it because, uh, yes, sir. The, the image came yeah. from somewhere else. Yeah. It was, not, it was second call. No, 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 it was all one call. That's open AI or wherever. Uh, that was stab call. stable diffusion. I sent the request, I got back a base 64 encoded string, which I decoded into that image. It was produced by Stable Diffusion's API, yes. Oh, they generate. Yes, they generate the image from my description, that's Not correct. Like other websites. No, no, no. So, no, this is their API. This is how they want you to access it programmatically. I registered with their API, I put in a credit card number. You know, I'm just sending them an HTTP request and I'm getting back an HTTP response that has the image in it. It's just an encoded form and I just decoded it. So I am sending them my information, it's just a request, and they do send me back the image. That image was born, generated by? Uh, AI generated images cannot be quote owned, they cannot be copyrighted. I mean the legal system's still dealing with this, but so far they've decided that much. It's mine now. <laughs> <laughs> For what it's worth, I mean, you know, but yeah, okay. The other part is, uh, I, I noticed that you have the model URL uh, sorted yeah. uh, as a string. Uh -huh. So when you're inside a country, uh, you have restrictions on how frequently you can go out. Yeah, well that, yeah, 
I did need an open network in order to access that URL. But that's true for any of these services. If you're going to access any of these services remotely, you have to be able to get there. Now, the only thing you could do inside the firewall is a llama. See, install it locally. With a llama, by the way, then the restriction is your own hardware. Do you have enough RAM? Do you have enough processing power to support a bigger model? The and Olama doesn't have very many image models. They do have vision models. They will interpret an image. But again, that's the only way to keep it inside the firewall. If you have other questions, talk to me afterwards, OK? Claude is in the cloud, right. So, well, they're somewhere out there, yeah. They have their own site. So, does all, so do all these models. Olam is the only one that's local, OK? All right. What I was going to say about RAG is, of course, you can see I don't have time to go into all the details of RAG, but you're going to have tons of talks about that. Go see Craig Wall's talk tomorrow about Spring AI. First of all, do not do RAG by hand. It's painful. It's annoying. It's too complicated. Use a framework for that. Okay, Spring AI, or the one I really like also, is Langchain for J. They've done a wonderful job. I would put them ahead of Spring AI at this point, but given time, you know, both of them do an excellent job. However, RAG was created when the context window was 2,000 tokens. Now, the rule is about 1,000 tokens is about 750 words of English on average. Okay? So, all you have is 2K tokens, that's not a lot of room. Then the, the context window jumped to 4K, and then GPT-4 said, oh yeah, we have an 8K model and a 32K model. 16, 32, they were really building up. And then Claude 2, before Claude 3, Claude 2 raised that limit to 100,000 tokens. That's a lot. And then GPT matched it. When Claude 3 came out, they raised it to 200,000 tokens. That's going to be substantial, and now GPT matched it. That's when Google stepped in with Gemini and said for Gemini 1.5, the one that's now available to everybody as of today, they could support a million tokens in the context window. If RAG is all about taking your data and, in, and, and slicing it up and encoding it to go in a vector database and then taking the question and searching that database for the relevant parts, the purpose of those relevant parts is to put them in the context window when you have limited room for that. A million tokens, I mean, I took my entire book, my Help Your Boss Help You book, you know, which is short, but it's my Managing Your Manager book, and, and I'll show you here that in my Gemini one, that's this one, uh, I did also ask it the ultimate answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything, of course. But what I want to show you is, uh, not that one, this one. I have my book, that's why this one's not in a GitHub repository yet, <laughs> is that I have the PDF of the book. Now, I did use the Apache Tika project to read in the book as a PDF and extract the text from it. So I'm not just dumping the PDF in there, I'm extracting. Now the frameworks will do that for you, you know? But I extracted the text, and then this is what the frameworks will call a uh, formatted uh, prompt, okay? So this is a prompt template, is really what they'll call. It said, here's the text from the book, and there I'm gonna put it in, the entire Help Your Boss Help You book. Answer the following question based on the information contained in the book, and then there's another spot, and I just said, give me the top five major points in the book, and then I just create a request and submit it. And as it turns out, there's also an endpoint at Gemini which will tell you how many tokens a message is going to require. And again, you got your three quarters thing going on. Well, my book has about 60,000 words in it, 65,000, something like that. According to the count endpoint, it took about 80,000 tokens. 80,000 tokens fits in a lot of these models. I don't need Gemini 1.5 for that. Yeah, I dumped the whole thing in there and got back a pretty darn good summary. I would show you, but I don't want to take your time right now. And it works out just fine. Now, therefore, what do I need RAG for? Well, what I need RAG for is the fact I don't want to send the 80,000 tokens in every single message. You know. Now, when I'm asking for a summary, summaries do better when they have the whole document. So that one's sure, but if I wanted to ask it you know, to find certain pieces of information or ask, it might be better to break it into chapters. It might be better, better to break it into similarity variables. You know, 
that it's pro there's lots of use cases for RAG. It can't be a bad thing to split up your document into easily searchable vector database information, you know? But look at the size of the context window now. A year ago, it was 4K. Now it's a million. What will it be a year from now, right? Library of Congress? I mean, these things are big. So let me wrap up everything here and, and mention a couple things. By the way, the one I didn't show you, which is really easy with OpenAI, is sending a text and having it generate an MP3 file reading the text to you. That's really easy to do. But I call RAG dangerously seductive because every developer who learns about it goes, oh, I get it now. Let me tell everybody I know about it. And you're like, okay, we get it. They all make videos. They all talk about it. Make, oh, I'm going to make a blog post. Yeah, we get it. You know? The question is, where do you use it and where don't you use it? And I'm sure Craig will have a lot more to say about that tomorrow. Okay. Uh, the frameworks, again, I mentioned Langchain for J. Langchain itself is a Python framework that is considered state-of-the-art in the Python world. Langchain for J is basically a ground-up rewrite. You know, they basically started over, and they've done a wonderful job with it. I, th I think they're doing great there. They've got this function calling and tool support where when you find something the, the tool doesn't do well, something that an AI model doesn't do well, you provide your own class with certain methods in it and say, okay, if you need it, call these methods. And with Langchain for J, that just gets an annotation called at tool. And it just says, oh, okay, I'll call that. I have an example where uh, it counts tokens. I have an example where it gets a weather report. Or I have an example where it uses open exchange rates to convert currency. And I ask it things like, hey, here's the prices of a bunch of this same item at different countries around the world. Which one's the best deal? And see, that's the sort of thing the AI tool can do. It'll use the tool that could get the exchange rates to convert it all to the same dollars or whatever and then it'll make an assessment for you. Uh, prompt templates, output parsers, those are all things that come with these frameworks. And of course, they all have built-in RAG support. Uh, I think very highly, uh, Langchain for J is at 0 0.30, whereas Spring AI, I think, is at 0 0.8.1, I think. Uh, it's scheduled to go 1.0 in May, but I don't, it was scheduled to go 1.0 last December. I, you know, we'll see. That's a hard problem. So again, just to review the process, Look at your input and output JSON data. Map them to records. If you're using Spring, make an HTTP exchange interface with the support beans. I didn't show you the support beans. You know, for the endpoints and the HTTP verbs, which are always either get or post. Then auto-wire that into a service class, which can have all your constants and your support methods, things to make it easier on the user. And, uh, just write lots of tests to make sure it's working right. If you're not using Spring, then you use your own HTTP client library, whether that be HTTP client or the Apache one or whatever you happen to like, uh, and configure a JSON parser yourself. That's often half the battle. That's what GPT-4 is for, right? Where I take the JSON data and I plug it in and say, give me some records that map to this. And sometimes they're useful and sometimes I have to tweak them, but it's not a bad start. Uh, I gave you all those different uh, demos and let's see, where's my, let me skip here. Uh, jumping robot, stable diffusion, transcription, fine tuning. And here is, where's my list of, ah, there, the list of GitHub repositories, okay? So those are, uh, they're not complete from everything I showed you and there's more coming, but I knew somebody would ask. I do not have these slides in there yet, but the slides aren't all that special. It's more the code that matters. But feel free to keep in touch, you know, stay, you know, let me know if you have questions or comments, and I'll say thank you very much for coming. Thank you.